Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this second Advent service. We hope that you can uh, come together now in our call to worship um, as it is printed on your screen. In this Advent season, we recall that when God's Anointed One comes, the desert will rejoice and flowers will bloom in the wasteland. When God's promised one comes, tired hands will receive new strength, and fearful ones will find fresh courage. When God's chosen one comes, the lame will leap and dance, the blind will see. When God's long-awaited one comes, the grieving and sorrowing will be forever free. Let us join together as we sing, There's a Voice in the Wilderness Crying. Let us come together in prayer. O God of Advent promise, we gather this day to hear your promises of peace and righteousness. We praise you for the hope and possibilities of this sacred season. As we anticipate the celebration of the Lord's birth and his coming again, may our preparation be faith-filled and joyous. In the name of the Holy One we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And if you have your Advent candle um, with you, the Advent candle um, wreath, we'd ask that you pause, or if you don't have it, I'd ask you that you pause, maybe you can go and get a candle for yourself for our Advent candle lighting ceremony. 
people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. The light grows gradually brighter as we move through Advent together. The candle of hope already burns bright. Today we light the candle of preparation and peace. The coming Christ desires us all to thrive, patiently wanting us to turn from the ways of sin and death. So as we wait for the coming of the day of God, we want to be ready. Seeking a straight path, we light this candle to guide our steps. Together, we prepare the way and strive to lead lives of holiness, goodness, and peace. The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry, and I say, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. 
Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lamb in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. The second reading is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. A class of six-year-olds was singing Hark the Herald Angels Sing at a a Christmas concert. The line, uh, God and Sinners Reconciled, was a a tricky one for this age group. And one little boy with a voice that completely drowned out the rest of the choir happily belted out, God and Sinners Dressed in Style. But such is the confusion, eh, that can rule around this time of year when we are celebrating a fact that has been become cluttered with a host of additions having nothing to do with the birth of Christ. But it is fun. We want greenery and stockings hung by the fire and dreams of Santa Claus coming and for some fruit cake and minced meat tarts. Once again, then, you may be a little disappointed by the scripture readings given for this Sunday from the lectionary. Yes, we are delighted with the reading from the prophet Isaiah that speaks expectantly about God preparing to do something wonderful. Isaiah writes, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. In the desert prepare a way for the Lord. The glory of the Lord will be revealed and all mankind shall see it together. You who bring good tidings to Zion, lift up your voice with a shout. Say to the towns of Judah, Here is your God. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. Can't you just sense the expectation and hope in those lines? These people are expecting a mighty deliverer, and they truly needed one. They waited for years and years and years. That's Christmas expectations. But then comes the New Testament reading with John the Baptist living in the wilderness, wearing a garment made from camel's hair, we might wonder if it was itchy, and eating locusts, which actually might have been a form of bean or nut, which was the food of the poorest of the poor. And he also ate wild honey, And he called for people to repent. Just a minute. That doesn't sound Christmassy at all. That sounds downright glum. Repent? Like, isn't that for later in Jesus' ministry? 
Again, we need to get the fuller picture of the reason for Jesus' coming. Jesus was coming to establish God's kingdom on earth. The kingdom of peace on earth, goodwill to men on whom his favor rests, as the angels announced to the shepherds at Jesus' birth. It was a very different kingdom than many of the rulers of that time who sought prestige and military power over their people. And it is very different from many of the governing powers of our day, although for many years some leaders in our Western world sought to model the example of Jesus. It is what made our Western world strong. As Dr. William Barclay points out about John the Baptist calling people to repentance, the coming of Christ is a purification of life, and the world needed that purification. Seneca called Rome a cesspool of iniquity. Juvenal spoke of Rome as the filthy sewer into which flowed the abominable dregs of every Syrian and Achaean stream. Wherever Christianity comes, it brings purification. Dr. Barclay uses three examples of the positive, exa positive change that Jesus can bring. He talks about the evangelist Billy Sunday a popular baseball player turned greatest evangelist of the first two, te two decades in the 20th century. He quotes the president of the Chamber of Commerce in a town that Billy Sunday had visited three years prior, saying, I'm not a member of any church. I never attend. But I'll tell you one thing. If it was proposed now to bring Billy Sunday to this town, and if we knew as much about the results of his work in advance as we do now, and if the churches would not raise the necessary funds to bring him, I could raise the money in half a day from men who never go to church. Billy Sunday took $11,000, but a circus comes here and takes out that amount in one day and leaves nothing. Billy Sunday left a different moral atmosphere. Dr. Barclay speaks of Billy Graham, a more contemporary evangelist, using one example of how a number of divorce actions were cancelled in one town when Dr. Graham came. He speaks about a number of the mutiny on the bounty survivors, reading from a Bible, and how the Lord positively changed them for the better before they were found on a deserted island. In calling people to repent, John the Baptist was calling people to turn around and to prepare themselves for the kingdom of caring and love for God and one another that Jesus was bringing. And, and isn't that what many people really want now? Aren't we looking for good news, for hope, for peace, for joy, for love? Someone said, I wish we could put some of the Christmas spirit in jars and open a jar of it every month. Someone else said, Christmas is too large to be tucked away in the toe of a child's stocking. What these people are saying is that the spirit of the real Christmas is a good, good thing. It is the spirit of the living God coming to live in human beings, not just at Christmas, but for always. John the Baptist was preparing people to be open to what God was doing. This year we may be experiencing disappointment in not being able to do a number of the traditional things we do that makes Christmas for us. I haven't seen my family in Ontario since last Christmas and don't think it's happening this Christmas either. We may feel like COVID is the Grinch that is stealing Christmas from us. But the Grinch's destructive plans didn't work. The people of the town of Whoville still were joyful. They had the real Christmas spirit. I am seeing Whoville people in our life at St. Andrews. People we don't even know, and people we do know, are calling the church and asking how they can reach out to the needy and may be forgotten this year. Isn't that lovely? The big reason for celebrating is the Lord has come and comes to those who invite Him in. Evil and sorrow will one day be totally defeated when the Lord returns and fully establishes His kingdom. Just now, 
the call of John the Baptist is still to us. Repent, that is, turn around and be open to the good news that Jesus wants to bring to us. He wants to dwell with us and to give us life. Thanks be to God. O Day of God, Draw Nigh. This hymn was written by a man from Toronto, Ontario, Robert Scott, born July 16, 1899 in Toronto, Canada, and died November 1, 1987, and was buried in McPherson Cemetery in Georgeville, Quebec. He was the United Church of Canada minister in Long Branch, Ontario, in 1926. During World War II, he served as a chaplain in the Royal Canadian Air Force. His major contribution was in the field of Old Testament scholarship, which can be clearly identified in this hymn. O Day of God Draw Nigh was written in 1937 for the Fellowship for a Christian Social Order. The Old Testament background is very evident in the hymn and the theme of the day of the Lord may be found throughout the scriptures and this hymn is based deeply in Old Testament scripture. This hymn is a song that calls us to radical justice, the basis of true hope and freedom and peace. O day of God, draw nigh. Let us come together once again in prayer. O God of the hills and valleys, the rough trails and the smooth highways, the green meadows and the dark alleys, the God who is with us in sickness and health, in despair and in hope, we ask that you will come to us once again during this Advent season and share with us your loving and powerful presence. Heavenly Father, while the whole world sings of peace on earth and mercy mild, we recognize how little our lives reflect these, your gifts. We know how often our actions and attitudes aggravate anger instead of promoting peace, and how we foster failure when we might express mercy. 
Forgive us, O God, we pray, and offer to us once again those gifts of love and tenderness that came to the world in the ancient manger of Bethlehem. And, O God, who stole into the world so long ago, we thank you for these moments of worship and quiet stolen in a week which has already maybe been very hectic and busy. We're trying to get ready for Christmas, but we still find ourselves unprepared for the birth of Christ, the advent of God's love made real in our very midst. Help us this coming week to spend time preparing our hearts to receive Him who was born our Savior. Help us to share His Spirit, His life with others, and so prepare our hearts and minds and lives in the days ahead that we may receive Him with joy at His coming. O God, our world is a mess. We need you so badly. We hear such different opinions about various things that it is difficult to know who to trust anymore. Please direct our leaders in your ways. Please give strength to those who are in caring positions in hospitals and institutions. Be with all those on our prayer list. Be with the lonely and the anxious. And please comfort those who mourn, and we lift them up to you in this moment. We also lift up to you those who are ill physically and mentally, in pain, waiting surgery, maybe having received distressing news. Lord, you are the Good Shepherd who cares for his sheep. May your tender care be with each and every one. And we ask this in our dear Savior's name. Amen. And now, this Christmas, rediscover God's love for you in all your fondest memories. Seek His peace in all your hopes and dreams. Hear His voice in the laughter of loved ones and greetings of strangers. For each new day is His gift to you and those whose lives you touch. God bless you, everyone.